Thanks very much for joining us again for more of the LLQP video series. We're going to spend the next few minutes looking at a fairly complicated concept actually, which is reinsurance. Now on the surface, the concept of reinsurance is not terribly complicated. What you have here is what's called the seeding company. That's the insurer that you will normally deal with. The insurers that we know well in Canada, companies like Sun Life or Canada Life or Transamerica or Annual Life or whichever. And this company, the seeding company, the company that originally goes out and does the business, is going to pass their risk on now to a reinsurer. And this reinsurer would be a company typically that we don't have any familiarity with in Canada, but that would be a fairly substantial global insurance company. Companies like Munich or Swiss Re or RGA. Canadian companies sometimes act as reinsurers in other markets, but they tend not to act as reinsurers in the Canadian market. What happens with the seeding company then? When you go out and sell a life insurance policy, when you as an agent go out and sell a policy, it looks good on the surface. You want to be selling policies, and certainly the insurance companies want you to be selling policies because that's what generates income for them. So when we look at the financial consequences to the insurance company of selling a life insurance policy, really the only income that they're going to generate from that policy is your premium. So just for the sake of argument, let's say you sell a policy on which the annual premium is $2,000. Hey, great. That's income for the insurance company. That means that client is going to be writing a check of $2,000 a year every year for the insurance company. But of course, the insurance company has some expenses as well. And these expenses are substantial especially in the first year. So when we look at the expenses, you have costs here like the agent's commission. So this varies a little bit from insurer to insurer, but probably if you're selling a $2,000 policy, the insurance company is paying out, let's say, $2,000 in commissions. There's a lot of variation in that depending on what insurance company you're working with and exactly how your compensation package is scheduled, but that's probably a fair start. And then we're going to have underwriting costs. We know that the insurance company is typically going to have to engage a medical professional here to help with underwriting costs. We know that they're going to actually have some administrative expenses associated with that. We know that they have to send, or they sometimes choose to send, uh, lab samples off for processing. So all of these things will have a cost. Let's say your underwriting costs are in the neighborhood of $500. And then you're going to have your typical administrative expenses, just with courier costs and making sure that all the I's get dotted and the T's get crossed and all that good stuff. Probably another $500 roughly. So we can see right from the start the insurance company isn't very excited about this financially in the first year, although most of these costs will disappear over a number of years. The real cost, though, for the insurance company, the real concern, is with what's called the policy reserve. Insurance companies aren't allowed to just say, you know what, we're going to collect enough premiums in a given year to pay out the amount of death benefits that we promised. Instead, they have to build what's called a reserve. And the reserve is a financial commitment that they make to you. Basically, when you buy life insurance or disability insurance or whatever it is, you're buying a financial commitment from the insurance company. They're saying, we have put money in a reserve for you so that if something goes wrong, you'll be able to then count on drawing from this reserve, not drawing from premiums that other people are paying in order to pay that death benefit. So this comes from a fairly complicated set of calculations, a, a time value of money set of calculations, and there are some accounting principles behind it. It's quite complicated. It's really the job of the actuary to determine this policy reserve, and the actuary does this 
in accordance with some rules that are set where we have to maintain a minimum level of reserve, what's called the Minimum Continuing Capital and Surplus Requirements, or MCCSR. These rules all come from or are enforced by the Office of the Superintendent. And this is a long one here. The Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions, or OSFI. That does that acronym does show up on the exam periodically or the title. And as you'll remember then hopefully OSFI is responsible for supervising insurers adequate reserves. So if you fall offside with OSFI, that means you haven't lived up to your commitments to your clients. And insurance companies will get the plug pulled when that happens, and that's when you can skip ahead and read what happens with Surus. So if you have a client who buys a policy where the premiums are two thousand dollars a year, you're gonna have this fairly complicated set of calculations, but it wouldn't be unreasonable to assume that maybe we're gonna to have to put fifty thousand dollars or more into a policy reserve. Like I said, that's the job of the actuary. You're not gonna to have to worry in any way, shape, or form about calculating that. You won't even really see this directly. But now the insurance company has a problem. Now the policy reserve, it works on a kind of in and out basis. So when clients lapse a policy, for example, the insurance company would report income coming out of the policy reserve. They no longer have that commitment to that client. Or if it's a term insurance policy and you just go to the end of the term, that's income for the insurance company. They no longer have to maintain that policy reserve commitment to the client. So the policy reserve is a fairly difficult bit of accounting actually and really knowing all the ins and outs of the policy reserve is well beyond the scope of this course. But the basic principle is that we do have to have these funds set aside. So what the insurance company will do here most often is they will farm out a portion of this and it tends to be a fairly hefty portion in today's insurance market. So they might farm out 50 to maybe 80 percent of this to a reinsurer. And by passing that on to the reinsurer now, they're reducing the amount that they have to then set aside, set aside themselves. So let's say that they pass on, just for the sake of argument here, $30,000, which would be 60% to that reinsurer. And this is done typically on an automatic basis. It's what's called treaty reinsurance. Not that you have to worry about that term for exam purposes, but Basically, what you're doing here is just the insurance company says, look, every policy we take on like this, the reinsurer knows our underwriting guidelines. They know our underwriting requirements. They probably help to build them. And so we know that we're just going to pass on $30,000 of that risk. So it's not like the reinsurer has to look at every policy. They already know what types of risks they're taking on because the insurance company has these rules in place. So we've got this $2,000 premium now. Well, it's probably fair to say that roughly 60% of that, let's say $1,200 of that, goes to the reinsurer in order to take on their risk. It might be a little bit less than that, so the insurance company gets a little bit of margin on that. But really what they've done here is they have passed on most of their risk for this client to the reinsurer, retaining not so much of the risk themselves. That means the insurance company really is going to try and make its money here rather than making money on risk management they're going to pass it on to the reinsurer to have the opportunity to make or lose money on risk management and reinsurance is an increasingly important part of the Canadian insurance market today now one other note just in case you run into this term on the exam is that the reinsurers as well sometimes pass on a portion of their risk they will employ what's called a retrocessionaire to deal with that risk. So you've got the seeding company, the reinsurer, and then possibly but not always the retrocessionaire. So I hope you've grasped this fairly complicated part of the Canadian insurance business. It's not a heavily tested topic, but you certainly could run into questions on it. 
And honestly, a good understanding of reinsurance can help you to understand the underwriting decisions that insurance companies sometimes make and how we see policies structured and built when they show up in your hands. Thanks very much. I hope this is helpful.